Uh, hello and welcome everybody and thanks for joining us. Very pleased to be here with Vitaya Cohen, who is the co-founder of Enapta. Enapta is uh, one of the leading uh, AEM electrolyzer companies. So welcome, Vitaya. Thank you very much for having me, Nadim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. An interesting company, uh, Enapta, so we, we've seen it come out um, relatively, relatively quickly, I guess, uh, maybe last, last three, four years. Um, and obviously, AEM is, is a new technology, I guess, for electrolyzers. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the background of, of, of both yourself and, and how you got into hydrogen and, and, and involved in um, co-founding Enapta and where, where Enapta has actually come from? Absolutely. Um, my hydrogen journey started in Thailand in 2015. I had just finished my studies in Canada, and so I moved uh, to a much warmer place. And um, I, I looked online on what was going on in Chiang Mai, uh, as I was quite curious, and uh, saw this self-sufficient home running on solely solar and hydrogen energy, as well as a rainwater collection system and a permaculture garden. This house was the Fisuea house. And I set out to meet the people who had conceived this idea of a self-sufficient home on hydrogen. And um, this is where I met Sebastian and Jan, his son. And I quickly learned that um, you can live solely on hydrogen uh, and that this is an energy storage solution. Fully captivated by it, um, I absolutely wanted to help and be on board and um, help them communicate the potential um, of green hydrogen, not only in Southeast Asia, but also in the world. So it all started off for the three of us as a more of a philanthropy action to um, educate and um, really raise awareness about green hydrogen in Southeast Asia. Instead of using diesel generators, for example, hydrogen could be used for on-site production of clean energy. So we held two events at the Fisua house, had a, a quite some, uh, some buzz generated about um, about this technology to really see it in action, to touch it, to see it. And um, then in uh, 2017, um, Sebastian had the chance um, to acquire Acta, which essentially was the company who sold him his electrolyzer in the first place. And having seen Sebastian so committed um, to spreading the word uh, as a really loyal and big fan customer, um, they realized that he, he could be much more and he could also provide uh, a vision um, for the AEM technology. So Sebastian acquired the debt of ACTA and uh, Jan, Sebastian and I um, co-founded Enapter end of 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're curious, Enapter comes from energy adapter, which ah, is how the two okay. comes together. Energy and adapter, I like exactly. it. Yeah. So really in the sense that uh, hydrogen can fit into all the sectors. That's a, that's a great story, um, both both from the sort of backpacking through Chiang Mai to, to <laughs> getting into the hydrogen industry to to um, to Sebastian liking the, the product so much he bought the company. Um, it reminds me, you're too young to, to know, but there was an, a famous advert on, I think it was Remington shaving, um, but it was very famous for saying, I like the product so much, I bought the company. But, um, <laughs> but there we go. Just um, AEM, the technology, and what, what, can you tell us a little bit about that for those that aren't sort of electrolysis experts and even for those that are electrolysis experts? Obviously, we're familiar with PEM, we're familiar with alkaline. Where does AEM come from? What's the advantages? What's the, the sort of brief um, technology uh, advantages of, of using that pathway? So the AEM stands for anion exchange membrane electrolyzer. In principle, it is like the PEM, but it is not letting protons through, it's letting anions through. So the AEM presents the advantages of the best of the two, the best of the alkaline and the best of the PEM. What it means is that it has high performance, high efficiency, and is also cost effective. Unlike the PEM, the AEM doesn't use noble metals. Yeah. And it reaches um, still good efficiency and, as I said, um, high performance, long lifetime, um, and cost effectiveness. Excellent. Perfect, succinct uh, explanation for those that aren't technically uh, um, fluent in, in, um, in electrolyzers. And so the, the business was founded and you've, you've said about, I see, sort of commercializing um, this technology. And where, where, whereabouts are you on the, on the, on the, on the long sort of path to commercial um, and what are, what are some of your goals um, now that uh, we're in 2020? And obviously, maybe some observations around how quickly you've seen change 
uh, particularly in 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 the realization that hydrogen is is real and and going to take going to play a major part of the energy mix um, going forward. Certainly, as we look to decarbonize. Sure. So. Since we started in November 2017 to today, we've already seen a cost reduction of 40% in our system. So that's just a bit of background uh, from November 2017 to today in 2020. Um, last year, we started our serial fabrication. So we've already moved up a level and now we are planning for our mass production facility. Um, this is currently in the making and we already know that um, this will house the, yeah, the mass production where many more electrolyzers will be coming out. Ultimately, our goal is to make electrolyzers and product and ultimately a commodity. So um, in terms of our pathway to commercialization, I think it's, it's quite fascinating to see all the different use cases um, uh, that are using our electrolyzers. Um, they're used in over 33 countries um, and used really across all sectors from smaller companies to bigger ones. Some customers, for example, are system integrators uh, in the power sector, but also in the mobility sector. They can also be uh, fuel cell manufacturers in, um, in the cars, for example, or aviation or drones. But it's also going into power to heat, for example. So our systems are used in a, a district heating project in the Netherlands. And um, of course, power to uh, gas is a really big sector as well, um, where our systems are used to create uh, green methane mm -hmm. um, in Australia, in Queensland. And um, just in May, they received a, a more funding to scale up the production of green hydrogen as well as green methane. Um, the research uh, sector is also very active in, uh, in better understanding um, hydrogen and everything else that you can do with it. So. Considering that our mission is to make green hydrogen cost competitive with fossil fuels, um, we believe that if we can make green hydrogen so cheaply, given that we are at the upstream of the value chain, the rest will follow and new business applications will open up along the value chains of uh, many businesses. So, and the, um, uh, in, in terms of mass production, um, are there any sort of clues that when you'll be able to move into that kind of that, that kind of stage in terms of mass production um and you know and and the sort of cost reductions you'll be able to achieve um mm -hmm. i mean it's it's stepping stones and, and sort of proving the technology but i guess um, learning how to produce technology is very <laughs> different from you know lab testing and um and having a, a product yeah, it's, it's definitely a whole other ball game. Um, I think one of the advantages that we have is that we make everything from A to Z. So we do have an overview of, of how can we um, make it quicker? How can we make it better? Um, so that, that's one great point that we have going on. Um, but I, I think if we just look at our timeline, um, we're looking right now for the location. We already have an announcement that we're um, that we're working on for the beginning of next year. And um, in terms of uh, when are we live mass in mass production, that will be around 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where we're like fully operational. Yeah. And um, in terms of uh, usage, I mean, you mentioned uh, quite a, a wide use, 33 countries. I mean, how, how do people actually get hold of them and, and what sort of scale are they? I mean, I'm assuming you can, they're, they're, they're fairly small, a small powered unit that you can, you can stack or, or what, how's it, how's it structured? Sure. I, I would say they're compact. Um, yeah. They're definitely compact electrolyzers. They're the size today of a microwave about. Um, mm -hmm. We've already seen cost reductions, but also size reductions. So size is also a really big uh, topic for us to make it smaller. Um, one analogy that we draw uh, in comparing who we are and what role we play in the electrolyzer industry is comparing is going back to the IT industry in the 1980s. The first computers were mainframe supercomputers. You couldn't even think about moving them. But then the portable computer came and completely disrupted the whole uh, industry. No one would have expected a small portable computer to have so much um, power to provide. And now here we go. We've got phones in our hands, which is the equivalence of a computer. And so this is also the, the, the role that we believe we'll play in the industry is that others are making large scale, huge single electrolyzers, whereas we're going more for the modular, uh, compact and standardized electrolyzer that has no technical limit to stacking mm -hmm. and to scaling. Mm -hmm. So 
whatever the hydrogen requirement output is, um, you can take our electrolyzers and stack them according to your need. And today we see a, a variety of, of, of different scales, which is why we believe that this is one of the solutions, not only in terms of the advantages of ramping up capabilities and as well as the resiliency, but also in terms of keeping it open for the whole market for those who may just need one electrolyzer to those who will need megawatt scale electrolyzers. Yeah. I like your analogy, sort of harking back to the days of, sort of IBM and, and, and building mainframes. And, and I guess that's one area that you, you see with, with technology disruption, you, you see a, a, a shift in the, in the value chain. And I guess for, for IBM, they were fixated on hardware and, mm -hmm. and Microsoft understood See Moore's law was driving the shift to software. So do you see that same um, approach with, with electrolysis that a lot of the value always tends to go head towards the software? Um, so we, is there any analogy there around the sort of software part? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and actually, yeah, organizing it. We're seeing the same in batteries as well. You know, battery mm. um, and energy storage software is increasingly where people are looking at in terms of, mm -hmm. of value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we believe that an energy future of the company, oh, sorry, a future energy company is uh, not just hardware, it's hardware and software. Mm. And so we've developed an energy management system that uh, quickens and eases integration because if you have something complicated, no one's ever going to use it. So we made a simple electrolyzer to integrate simply by scanning a QR code and also made um, really beautiful UI, great UX um, for the integrator to understand how is the electrolyzer performing, but also to allow it to communicate it with the other energy systems. Because we're only one piece of this puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. We need solar panels, inverters, yeah. fuel yeah. cells, batteries, et cetera. Yeah. And so all these different pieces are coming from different manufacturers. They have different protocols, different languages. And so what we've developed is a energy management system that understands all these languages that puts it together and that enables the whole energy system to act as one. Mm. Not only to that. Be, to be optimized, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah and also yeah, to set yeah. rules uh -huh. because, I mean, we're talking about renewable energy here, so yeah. we're highly weather dependent. Yeah. Um, so you want to keep an eye on that, but you also want to say, hey, the sun is out, let's start making electrolyzer or, oh, mm. storage tank is full, let's stop producing mm. hydrogen. So you have all these different um, uh, features. Um, and so it's great from a, a, for a, a partner, a system integrator or a, um, an EPC and IPP, but it's also quite fun for a user to be able to follow the production of their own energy system to remote control it as well. You can start and stop your hydrogen. Um, so we've taken both aspects into consideration, not only electrolyzer, but also the software to enable scaling green hydrogen. Yeah. And it, given the wide scale of your current customers and, and, and understanding, uh, I guess, sort of different business models, what, what are your thoughts around, I guess, the future of hydrogen and, and just thinking about centralized and decentralized? You see, you see both, both models existing. Um, you see value, obviously, in decentralized because it you know, off, offsets the cost of transport um, and you can produce hydrogen uh, at your point of consumption, um, but obviously for large use, there, there is clearly, um, you know, there should be huge economies of scale from, from doing sort of gigawatt, gigawatt high, um, hydrogen production. What, what, are, what are some of your thoughts to, to that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're more on, on the decentralized energy production side, um, mm -hmm. simply because, um, again, if we take an analogy and we look at solar panels, Right. Solar panels in the very beginning, no one thought it would be a commodity and look at where we are today. It's the cheapest form of energy. Right. And yeah. so the solar panel created prosumers. We believe that on-site hydrogen production can also enable um, people to make their own resource and also enable energy independence and security. Mm -hmm. um, also, another point in terms of on-site production and cost, we have um, one of our customers, for example, Zero Avia, um, completed its first commercial flight test in the UK a couple uh, weeks ago. And um, they have chosen our systems because they are able to produce on-site production at the airport. Mm -hmm. This is what's making right hydrogen aviation yeah. cost effective. Yeah, so yeah. Is, that's where we're at. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and I guess it sort of harkens back to the origins and, and, and I guess the culture of Anapta, which was obviously <laughs> the, 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 the house in Thailand. Um, in terms of sort of going forward, um, 2020, 2019, what, what, what are some of your goals, objectives? If people are watching this, um, what, 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 why should they be contacting you and what, what, who are you looking to, to speak to and what, what are some of your short-term objectives? Yeah, so just recently we launched our partner program. Um, mm. So we're definitely reaching out to system integrators, um, EPCs, IPPs, anyone who wants to get involved in deploying the energy, the hydrogen infrastructure, mm. and that has the knowledge of renewable energy. And that's like, ooh, hydrogen, it seems like it's coming up and they want to develop that. Mm. Talk to us, honestly, because this is, um, we work together, we provide um, a lot of value and learn from you as well. And um, I think uh, this is something that we want to develop more and more to have more partners so that the end user that writes to us has someone that they can reach out to to get their hydrogen system installed. The demand is there. It's just that we have to focus on the production in order to scale up um, our production. So I would definitely say partners. But uh, I mean, we're planning a factory here. We need a lot more people. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely need... Um, yeah. A lot of young minds, but also a lot of experienced minds uh, to help set up our factory and um, to really get this going and to, to scale electrolyzers and to set up the next generations of our electrolyzers and to, to reach our goal to make cost competitive green yeah. hydrogen. And uh, you, may, you mentioned location. I guess that, that hasn't been decided. Has country been decided? I know you're, you're already quite geographically well spread with, with you know, your software team in in, in St. Petersburg and you yourself in, in the Berlin office and, and obviously your founder and another interest in, in sort of Thailand and, um, and obviously the original, um, I guess, IP in, in, um, in Pisa in Italy, is that right? Correct. Yeah. yeah, it's in yeah. Pisa. Yeah. The, the factory though uh, will be in Germany. This ah. has been decided. Sprung Dirk technique, as they used to say. <laughs> Very good. Okay, excellent. Um, well, many thanks for, for, for sharing your thoughts um, about Anapta. You'll be speaking well next week, um, where we have the solar and hydrogen um, event. Um, so you'll be on the, the World Hydrogen Leaders platform as well. So people will be able to contact you through that, um, as well as the, all the usual all the usual channels. So. Um, Thanks for, for taking some time out of your day to, to share some of your thoughts. It was, it was great um, chatting to you and you really helped, um, well, certainly helped me position Anapter in, uh, in what you're doing, your technology and, and, and where you're coming from. So um, thanks for that. Thank you, Nadim. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers.